Good evening, everyone. My name is Rose Kuizam Villazor, and I am the interim co dean of Rutgers Law School. Welcome to our round table entitled What's Going On with the Supreme Court The End of Roe and the Future of Rights. I'm really happy to see you tonight. And this round table is extremely important. This uh, round table will be a conversation about rights protected by Roe versus Wade, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, and the impact of the leak opinion on Dobbs versus Jackson women's health on those rights and other rights that are implicated by Roe and Casey. The stakes are so high that we here at Rutgers Law School will be recreating, reconstituting the Women's Rights Law Clinic and which will be named after Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg so that our students and our faculty will have the ability and opportunity to respond to the impact of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health. Let me now briefly introduce the speakers for tonight and also ask them to explain just briefly their research and uh, their writing agenda. I'll introduce each of them in alphabetical order. First is Ron Chen, Professor Ron Chen, who is University Professor of Law. Next is Professor Katie Iyer, Professor of Law. And last but certainly not least is Dean Kim Mutcherson, who is the co-dean of Rutgers Law School here in Camden. Um, now, if I can just ask each of the speakers to just say a little, um, a few words about their research and their writing agendas. Oh, thank you, uh, Dean Villas Rights. So we'll also go in alphabetical order. Um, I, uh, I, my interest comes uh, mainly from my background as a civil rights and civil liberties attorney. I am, uh, for instance, very active in the American Civil Liberties Union, where I'm one of the three general counsel. I teach in the Constitutional Rights Clinic, where uh, uh, I litigate a lot of cases, usually in New Jersey state courts on individual rights. So the methodology of how rights are defined and redefined is uh, of extreme practical and professional interest to me. So next in alphabetical order, I'm Katie Iyer. Uh, I'm a former LGBTQ rights lawyer before um, of becoming an academic, and my work continues to focus on statutory and constitutional anti-discrimination law, um, both specifically in the context of LGBTQ rights, but also in the context of disability, race, um, sex, and other areas. And now displaying the fact that we all know how alphabetical order works, um, I'm Kim Mutcherson. I am a reproductive justice scholar, um, which means that my work sort of runs the gamut along the reproductive spectrum um, from deciding to get pregnant to deciding whether you're gonna stay pregnant to deciding how you're gonna raise your children once you have them. Um, I am specifically interested in abortion um, and assisted reproduction. So this is 100% in my wheelhouse. Well, thank you, Kim, Katie, and Ron for joining us tonight. I also want to thank our co-sponsors for tonight's roundtable, the Rutgers Law School Institute for Professional Education, the Center for Gender, Sexuality, and the Law and Policy, Rutgers Alumni Network, and the Women's Law Forum. I also want to thank Nate Nakal, Joe Nagel, and Katie Sfera for their administrative support for this program. Um, there will be CLE credits uh, given out during the, the event, and what we will do is that Joe Nagel will uh, write in the chat the CLE code, and then I will also make sure to verbalize the code so that way you will get those credits. Okay, so without further ado, let's first contextualize the conversation by talking about the issues at stake. So, uh, Kim, do you could you please just provide a brief overview of Dobbs and the key issues and uh, the arguments that were raised there uh, first, so that we have a better sense of what we're really talking about? Absolutely. Um, so, I'm going to try to encapsulate very quickly um, abortion law. <laughs> leading up to Dobbs and then where we are um, with Dobbs. So you'll all recall, obviously, Roe versus Wade in 1973, um, and Roe created the trimester framework. First trimester, no uh, regulation at all. Second trimester, states can regulate, but only in the interest of the health of the pregnant woman. Um, and third trimester, states can go as far as to ban, but there has to be an exception for the life and health um, of the pregnant woman. So Roe was um, very clear in that sense. Um, then we got Planned
Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992, coming out of Pennsylvania. Um, and Casey, in Casey, the court said, all of this trimester stuff is ludicrous. Um, we did a really, we've been doing a really bad job of protecting the state's interest in potential life. Um, and so we can't use a trimester framework anymore. Um, and then they shifted us to a viability standard and said, that's where we're gonna draw the line, right? So before viability, here's how you can regulate. After viability, um, here's how you can regulate. After Casey, states took that as an invitation to create a whole host of regulations related to um, abortion, everything from regulating, you know, who could provide abortions. That's where we got our waiting, you know, 24 hour waiting periods from um, uh, specific informed consent requirements, sometimes involving science that isn't actually science. Um, who can perform abortions, sort of the whole gamut, where they can be performed. Um, and so I, one of the things I think is really important for people to, to keep in mind um, is that access to abortion has been significantly limited for a whole bunch of folks in this country since 1992. Um, and then we find ourselves at Dobbs. So there have been a couple of other cases um, in, the, in the recent past that went up to the US Supreme Court. Um, June Medical Services went up, home health, uh, Whole Woman's Health went up. And in both of those cases, again, which were fairly recent, the court reaffirmed the idea that there's a constitutional right um, to abortion. Dobbs versus Mississippi comes along. I, I keep saying Dobbs versus Mississippi. Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health um, comes along out of Mississippi. And basically what Mississippi did was they passed a 15 week ban, um, which under both Roe and Casey is absolutely unconstitutional. There's just no getting around that. Um, so when it went up to the court, the question was, is every pre-viability ban unconstitutional. That's what the court was originally going to look at. Um, by the time the case actually came to argument um, and the final briefing, the, the makeup of the Supreme Court had shifted and Mississippi also shifted its position to being actually, now that we're here, this is an opportunity to actually look at Roe and just decide whether Roe should be overruled. So that is the core of what's being decided um, in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, whether Roe will be overruled and these issues sent back, um, uh, sent back to the state. Um, so do you want me to talk about the draft now or do you wanna wait until later? Yeah, no, that, that's really great to give us an overview of the issues leading up to Dobbs. So now let's talk about the leaked opinion, which panelists here should have received a link to the from the Politico uh, when Politico um, released it. So tell us a little bit about what the, uh, the opinion says. Sure. Um, so first of all, we all get to be collectively aghast right, <laughs> that a Supreme Court opinion um, was leaked in this way. Um, and the draft, the majority opinion um, draft was from Alito um, and said exactly what uh, those of us who do this work imagined it would say. Um, takes the opportunity to completely overrule Roe um, and Casey basically said those cases were wrongly decided, that Roe was wrongly decided um, at the time, that it was an example of judicial overreach um, and judicial politics. Um, uh, says that there is no fundamental right to be found in the Constitution or to be extrapolated from the Constitution um, to terminate a pregnancy. Um, and then, of course, goes to that analysis that, court, that the court does for fundamental rights, that it is not rooted in the nation's history and traditions. And we'll talk about that more um, in our conversation today. Um, they also, of course, have to give some sort of account of why stare decisis isn't appropriate here. Um, and part of what he says there um, is that there is no reliance interest, right? That nobody is organizing their life around the belief that if they become pregnant in a set of circumstances where they don't want to remain pregnant, um, that they will be able to terminate that pregnancy. So it's actually, um, I would say, a surprisingly short opinion, frankly, um, given the depth of what is being discussed there. Um, and it's also an opinion because it was leaked. It's an opinion where um, lots of people have already been able to sort of poke holes in, it, in some of the analysis. Um, and a piece of that that I think is really important is the claim about um, the right to abortion not being deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions because it was criminalized um, at various points in our country's history um, and conveniently leaving out that at the time that he is referencing, women weren't even allowed to vote in this country. 
and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. So that's great. So what, what we're going to do is unpack all the various um, issues and, and um, parts of the opinion or the leaked opinion that, um, that Kim talked about. And just so we, again, appropriately um, set the stage for others, uh, we'll be talking about the implications for abortion and other reproductive rights. And then we'll also go outside the re reproductive rights space and talk about what other rights are implicated by uh, this opinion. Um, and then we'll, we'll take a look at the methodology for analyzing fundamental rights as Justice Alito explained it. And then we'll then also talk about what does that mean, the inner workings of the court when an opinion has been leaked? What's the implications for the law clerks and for the justices themselves? So and I forgot, I forgot one big issue, Rose. What? Which one? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, the other big issue that I should have mentioned um, is that a foundational part of Alito's opinion is that the right to privacy doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore, right, you can't extrapolate from the right to privacy to the idea that you also have a right um, to terminate a pregnancy. So that is that is a huge, huge issue that's certainly worth us talking about um, today. Well, and we'll we'll definitely talk about that. And then the last thing that I I hope that we'll have time to talk about is the alternatives for what are some of the state um, alternatives that we can engage in. I mentioned uh, the RBG clinic, but what are some of the other approaches that we can all collectively do in order to address um, the impact of Dobbs? Um, so here um, in the leaked opinion, Justice Alito supposedly uh, wrote, "We hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled." And so it's quite clear, right, that that is uh, the key goal here of uh, the, the outcome in this opinion. So I'd like to ask Ron first, if Roe and Casey are indeed overruled, what does that mean for abortion rights in the United States? <clears throat> well, uh, it, it leaves us in a very complex and complicated, and some would say completely chaotic uh, network of different state laws. Justice Alito said that his purpose was to return this issue to where he, he believed, uh, and those who could them believed it should rest in the first place with the states. Um, and the states uh, are all over the map, uh, literally, on this issue. Roughly, without getting exact numbers, you may have about 20 states that would maintain, and New Jersey is one of them, uh, that would maintain uh, essentially the, the, the same if not uh, even greater protections to a reproductive choice as existed under Roe versus Wade. And those states are roughly, they tend to be in the Northeast uh, and the West Coast. You have maybe an equal number of states that if they have the ability and it looks like they're about to get the ability would have a total ban on uh, abortion. I, uh, Texas, Mississippi uh, are, are well known to be issues and maybe about 10 states where uh, we, we still have to take stock of maybe results of upcoming elections, or uh, they might examine to see if there is any nuance in, in the final opinion, which uh, it was a leaked draft. It was those of us who clerked are used to seeing first drafts, which do end up being quite different from what ends up being the opinion. And uh, while this draft was, I think, quite um, stark in, in the way in, in its holding and perhaps uh, did not have that nuance that some people might thought, uh, thought of. We, you don't know. We'll, we'll have to wait for the final opinion. And there, there are some states that might want to look and, and see what that what that opinion says. But what that leaves us is obviously is in a, in a country that obviously has become much and much more uh, uh, cross-fertilized and utilized uh, and unified in an economic sense, we will have very different laws in New Jersey. You might have to just cross the border to Pennsylvania uh, and, uh, and get a very different result. And so I think there will be a lot of uh, uncertainty as to how to deal with situations, for instance, in which uh, women who have the ability to do something want to travel to a state where uh, abortion remains legal and what what are the legal implications about uh, about about those attempts, uh, I, I think it would be impossible to predict right now um, how the dust is going to settle. But it is going to be an entirely new world. And you're right that there, because there will be a patchwork of different laws, then there are uh, different. Uh, it, it impacts 
women and people differently, right? I mean, as it is, as, as Kim mentioned, there were already restrictions um, to reproductive rights since Casey. Mm -hmm. and, and depending on states that Texas, for example, a vast state like that, um, not uh, there, are, there have been difficulty, uh, challenges, barriers to reproductive rights in gaining in, in going to um, abortion clinics. Um, and so there are impacts based on race, on class, uh, those who live in rural areas versus those who live in urban areas. So there's a complicated set of um, problems. That and it probably goes without saying, but we should articulate it anyway. But we can draw some lessons from what the situation was prior to Roe. Women who had the economic means to do so could, could get an abortion. They could either find a place or find a what methodology to do that. Uh, those who are... Uh, from economically disadvantaged backgrounds obviously did not. And they that that heavily correlated to those who came from communities of color, community, immigrant communities. And um, there is going to be, a, there's I think a large concern that that situation is going to represent itself uh, if the decision comes out anything like the way the draft opinion suggests it will. Great. Katie, do you want to um, offer some thoughts, too, about the impact of this patchwork of state laws that would have on those who will be impacted by, uh, by Dobbs? Or Kim, either one of you, just want to give you an, uh, an opportunity to respond to that. Yeah, I mean, the, the only other thing I would add is, um, you know, thinking more expansively, and I know we're going to get to this in just a moment, about um, you know, other types of fundamental rights claims, even in the reproductive rights or reproductive justice space, right? That it's not just about rights to abortion and probably the rights that we're gonna see most proximately challenged are other ones concerning reproductive control over one's body. So I think immediately, for example, about, for example, for sterilization, which is still something that, or core sterilization is still something that uh, especially people with disabilities uh, confront in their day-to-day -day lives. Thank you. What, uh, Kim, what other reproductive rights um, that, that are, implic are, are implicated by Dobbs or at, at risk as a result of if Roe and Casey are indeed overruled? Mm -hmm. um, so, so like I said in the beginning, I'm a reproductive justice scholar, so I'm sort of interested what happens from the, you know, sort of, sort of from the beginning to the end. Um, and I also work a lot on assisted reproduction. So I'll just talk about a couple um, of pieces there. Um, so one is what happens with contraception, um, in part because um, states have been willing to define abortion more broadly than medicine defines abortion. So for instance, um, a contraceptive um, that potentially um, keeps a fertilized egg from implanting would not be considered an abortion um, by most physicians. Um, but if you write it into a statute and say that is now an abortion, then all of a sudden, then you have an issue with IUDs. Um, you know, there are some questions about what this will mean, for instance, for plan B, right? Which again is an opportunity for a fertilized egg to potentially not implant um, because you've taken um, plan B after having unprotected sex. Um, so that's a thing that we really wanna pay attention to sort of how it um, leaks into other parts of the world because we allow legislatures to define things on their own, um, even when medicine and science say otherwise. The other piece of this that I am, you know, the, the law nerd in me is like super excited about this, but the person who cares about people is less excited about it, um, which is in terms of the fertility industry. So um, if you have a state that says, um, you know, pregnancy starts from the moment that an egg is fertilized, we live in a country where there are literally millions of frozen embryos in all sorts of fertility clinics across the country. So what happens when a state says, well, you know what, if you're not gonna use those frozen embryos, that's basically the same as you, you know, taking an infant and dropping them off at a firehouse, right? You have abandoned those children um, and we do, we'll do what we do with abandoned children, which is we will swoop them up and we will find homes for them. Um, and people think I'm kidding when I use the phrase embryo adoption. I have not made that up. That is actually a thing that exists already um, and that people can choose to do. 
Um, it is often used in very deeply religious communities, but it is still a thing um, that people can choose to do. So imagine a world in which the, uh, your, you know, the state says to you, well, if you decided to do fertility services here and you've left embryos here, we're going we're gonna to find homes for them. Don't worry about it. You can't, you can't destroy them. You can't leave them frozen. Um, you, can't, you, know, uh, you can't give them uh, for research we're gonna make sure that somebody tries to bring them to fruition. Um, and again, because people tend to think, oh, you're just sort of you know, spitballing and coming up these you know, off the wall scenarios. Um, Arizona already has a statute on the books that says when there's an embryo dispute, so let's say two people were married, they get divorced, they'd made embryos together, and now they're fighting over who gets the embryos. Um, Arizona law says they should go to the person who has the best chance of bringing them to fruition. So we're, we're already in that world. It's just a function of how much further into that world we can get, um, depending upon when and how the law changes. There's so much there that I, I know what we need to talk about, and that's when we get more deeper into our understanding of rights but um, and, and the methodology that the court used. But I, I think it's also, this is a good time for us to talk about the other rights that are implicated by Dobbs. And then we can go back and then talk much more broader about fundamental rights. Katie, could you talk about the implications of Dobbs for other substantive due process rights? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, and I wanna preface all this by saying that I am not a sky is falling person. And I, 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 and I do not, um, I'm not, even in this particular context, I am not as persuaded that the entire sky is gonna fall. What I'm gonna lay out is sort of the worst case scenario. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the reasons I think that we might not see that worst case scenario. So understanding the full implications of Dobbs requires understanding what are the array of rights that are protected by substantive due process. Um, I'm sure everybody on here knows this, right? But the basic idea behind substantive due process is that there are certain um, uh, rights that are so fundamental uh, to us that even if government uses fair procedures, they have to have a substantively adequate reason for what they're doing. So I think a classic example that almost anybody can relate to is taking away one's child, right? That uh, even if government used totally fair procedures to do that, if they had a completely trivial reason for doing so, that would be, uh, you know, our gut instinct is that would be impermissible. And the court, in fact, has long recognized this across an array of contexts. Um, a, a set of those uh, decisions have applied the Bill of Rights to the state. So substantive due process rights include, for example, the right not to have uh, your state government or your local government uh, violate the First Amendment has applied to you. It, it includes those rights, um, which again, I think most people sort of take for granted, but in the original Bill of Rights were not applied to the states. Um, so it's via substantive due process that we get that. Um, and it also includes a really long string of rights that fundamentally have to do about really personal, intimate types of decision making. So uh, again, coming back to the ability to make decisions vis-a-vis -vis your child, what's traditionally called, in my view, somewhat offensively, the care and control of your child, uh, the fundamental right uh, to that. Um, we also see, uh, uh, as Dean Mutcherson referred to, a number of rights sort of clustering around reproductive rights, like rights to use uh, contraception, uh, um, a, a little bit of a mixed history from the court on the right to avoid unwanted sterilization. Um, the right to marry has been recognized both in the, con in, 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 actually an array of contexts, first starting in the context of um, interracial marriages, but then also prisoner marriages, uh, uh, and most recently, uh, same-sex marriage. The rights of, of even deadbeat dads to get married, uh, right, has been recognized by the court. Um, and um, uh, then we've also seen some opinions in which the court has been perhaps a little bit more vague about whether they're recognizing a fundamental right, but um, where many people believe that they did, for example, Lawrence versus Texas, which struck down the nation's um, sodomy laws. So 
Um, that's sort of the landscape at the court itself. There's also to be clear ongoing litigation in the lower courts about new rights. So things like a fundamental right for to gender autonomy for transgender people, uh, or a few years back, there was litigation over whether there's a fundamental right for children to be left a world in which it's habitable, all right, which has not been destroyed uh, by their elders. Um, and uh, you know, all of these rights, which um, have been established, many of them for a very long time, relied on a methodology, which as we're going to flesh out, the Dobbs opinion really seems to repudiate, which is essentially building on precedent, building on some core concepts about what we think of as uh, fundamental, which tends to be really important personal things, um, often centered on the family, um, and sort of Reasoning by analogy from prior cases. That's, of course, exactly what Roe did. Um, and the court is very derisive of uh, uh, and, and sort of dismissive of that methodology. Um, instead, it picks up this language, which does exist in some of the other uh, prior cases and which the court has relied on in some prior cases, but which it has never consistently followed, which says, no, we need to look to history and see if there is a right deeply rooted in history. Um, and of course, many of the rights that I just discussed, they are not rights deeply rooted in history. Uh, um, uh, you could take, for example, the right to interracial marriage. That was not uh, 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 deeply rooted in history uh, at the time of the 14th Amendment's ratification. Uh, uh, so too uh, with same-sex marriage uh, um, and lots, uh, the vast majority basically of the other rights. Uh, I think it, it's, um, you could easily see how the reasoning of the opinion might lead to the same conclusion the court reads, reaches about uh, overruling Roe. So that's the worst case scenario. <laughs> I'm gonna talk now a little bit about why I uh, don't think the sky is going to fall, at least not immediately. Um, so the first reason is that this language that the court relies on, the methodology that it relies on, has actually been around for some time. So this has been a longstanding debate in the cases uh, uh, um, between different camps of the court, whether we really rigidly have to look to history and a narrowly defined right, or whether we have this sort of more expansive precedent-based approach. Um, and so uh, to, to some extent, this is not new. It is new for the court to overrule a prior case, um, but the methodology itself uh, has long vintage, and there is a competing methodology that can be relied on to argue against it. Um, I also think that the court is going to be, and this may just be the optimist in me, reluctant to immediately overturn a whole spate of rights uh, that many Americans take for granted, right? We take for granted the idea that we can have access to contraception. We take for granted the idea that uh, 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 you know, we can marry who we choose. We take for granted, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, the idea that we can raise our children in the way that we see fit. And while not all of those rights touch every person, I think enough people are touched by some of them that if the court were to do a sort of thoroughgoing, uh, you know, sort of repudiation of that approach to substantive due process, it would upset many people, including many people who probably don't think of themselves as liking this area of doctrine, right? So the same folks who wanna homeschool their kids and not have too much state intervention, right? If if uh, the right to same-sex marriage goes, so too under this methodology goes the right to, you know, uh, uh, have that ability to really decide for yourself how to raise your kids. Um, so I, I'll stop there, but I, I think that's sort of the, the worst case scenario, sky is falling, as well as some of the reasons I think uh, it's unlikely to happen at least uh, right away. Well, I, I appreciate the optimism. I'm an optimist myself, um, but at the same time, I, I recognize um, also why others are saying the sky is falling. There are so many rights at stake. But you, you started talking about the methodology for analyzing fundamental rights, and, and I, I'd like for us to unpack that a, a little bit more. So why, why don't I turn to Ron? And Ron, if you can just talk just a little bit about how uh, fundamental rights are, at least the courts, how the courts have... Um, analyze fundamental rights using this test of deeply rooted in our history and traditions. Katie says it's not necessarily new. Uh, the analysis, uh, Justice Alito's um, opinion, the, the leaked opinion, suggests that he's using the same analysis. What, what is your sense about um, the methodology employed in this case? Yeah, Katie is certainly right that the debate between the use of history, historical understanding, 
textualism versus a more interpretivist approach. That that debate is going up, been uh, going on for for decades, and uh, with um, with varying results. Uh, and therefore, I would I also tend to agree with uh, Katie that it is perhaps too early to project what might be the most extreme fallout if. His, this historical use of history and understanding and identifying through whatever uh, means are given to whatever judge is trying to determine what the what is uh, deeply rooted in our history and traditions, what that reveals, what, would that allow, would that uh, undermine Obergefell? Would it undermine Plyla versus Doe and all, all, the, uh, all the cases dealing with family autonomy? Uh, I agree with Katie that I think it's a bit too early to uh, to say that all that is uh, at risk. Although I've, I've I've heard mainly elected politicians almost uh, licking their chops and saying, "Ah, now." Uh, particularly, I've heard lots of politicians saying, "Well, now with this, let's go after apply La versus Doe, so we don't have to uh, pay for the public education of uh, 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 children of undocumented immigrants." Uh, 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 but uh, the, the the methodology, of course, there there are there are rights whose existence uh, cannot really be denied because they are literally in in the Bill of Rights: free speech, um, uh, freedom of religion, etc. And and while uh, the the justices can disagree about the scope, they obviously can't disagree about the existence. There are then these unenumerated rights, and and Katie, I think, has given us. Um, a comprehensive list of those that have come up in uh, in contemporary cases <clears throat> that are uh, not textually found. Uh, I guess I'll preface that by saying, of course, it depends on how you define uh, the right involved. Is there a, can you find words to suggest a right to an abortion? <laughs> no, and, they said they, and therefore uh, and those who, and they, they end up be, usually being uh, uh, ju judicial conservatives say that unless it is deeply rooted in our history and condition, it just, it just doesn't exist. But uh, you might say there is nothing in the text of the Constitution that says there's a right to abortion, and that we can find now, as Justice Alito did not find it in that draft opinion, uh, any history of a right to abortion. But what if you broaden it a little bit and say a right to have control over uh, one's own body? Uh, then that becomes a, a much more debatable issue about what our uh, history and traditions uh, uh, find. And right now, I'm hearing a lot of arguments, very often from conservatives, that things like, should I be required to get a vaccine or uh, uh, are, uh, are long, deeply rooted constitutional rights, um, and their history and tradition uh, uh, comes out differently. So how do you define, and I, this is one of the major, crit major criticisms, I think, of the uh, of use of history and tradition is that how you define um, what you are looking for as far as history and tradition very often then determines uh, the answer. Uh, I myself now I, I don't know if anyone who says that in interpreting arguably ambiguous words in the Constitution uh, that you 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 totally disregard history and tradition. I don't, I think that would be an extreme uh, view as well. But you know. Constitutional interpretation is not like uh, the following instructions to put together something you get from IKEA. It's uh, <laughs> it's not that rote. It's not that mechanical, and you have to use a variety of interpretive tools um, in, in order to um, uh, to reach an answer. And therefore, I think this uh, this uh, conflict that is that has been posed between um, the historical understanding, the textualists. Um, and those who have a more expansive uh, view of how to interpret the Constitution. In some ways, it's um, uh, in any given debate, it, you, you put a label of which, which uh, interpretive tool gets you to the result that you want, and that determines whether that day you're a historical understanding or interpretive or an, an interpretivist person. Um, and um, uh, it, it makes for, uh, for headlines, but when when it comes down to actually interpreting the text of the constitutions, it's not it's not down to that uh, black and white division. Thank you, um, D. Mutchison. Do you want to add a few words too? 
Um, I, I just want to be the, the glass half empty person here because I am not typically an optimistic person. Um, and in part, that's rooted in the fact that, um, you know, there were a number of folks who work in the abortion world, who are activists, who, you know, run clinics, whatever, um, who the last few election cycles were like, Roe's going to fall, Roe's going to fall, you got to pay attention, this is what's coming. Um, and, you know, some of us were called hysterical and calm down and you're being outrageous. Um, and here we sit on the edge of, of Roe falling. Um, so I think we have to be really careful about, um, you know, uh, make, making too many assumptions about what's possible, particularly in a world in which the campaign to get a Supreme Court that looks like the Supreme Court that we have now was a total long game. It was a lot of money, it was a lot of focus um, and a lot of work to get to the point where the Supreme Court is the, is the Supreme Court that we have now. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of organization that goes on around these issues. Um, and even though, you know, in the, in the oral argument and then also in the leaked opinion, you know, Alito is very clear, oh, no, 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 this is just about abortion. None of these other rights are going to be on the chopping block. Um, and in the oral argument, no, 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 that, you know, the SG was asked this question by Justice Sotomayor, you know, what happens to these other rights? No, 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 you know, those, those are clearly uh, protected by the Constitution. There's no way, you know, any of those rights are going anywhere. Um, um, and yet, you know, you read the amicus briefs that came in and it is clear, you know, the Texas right to life amicus brief, which says, you know, these other, Roe was an abomination, Obergefell was an abomination, right? I mean, so this, this is a campaign. It's not just one case. This is a campaign. And I think that we want to really sort of stay on our toes about, you know, what's next and what's possible. Thank you. I'd like to um, talk a little bit more specifically about the, the, the impact that the Mississippi law itself has on some um, individuals. So um, I, there are a couple of questions that were raised. One question is with respect to young girls who are, in, uh, who are raped, let's say, and um, what rights do they have, if any at all, after this. And then the second one deals with um, whether, wasn't there an exception in the Mississippi law to begin with for um, some women? So uh, Kim, could you talk a little bit about those two um, uh, scenarios? Sure. Um, so again, as a starting point, Roe and Casey both made it clear that any statute that eventually banned abortion had to have um, an exception for the life and health of the mother, not necessarily a rape and incest ex exception, um, which I'm pretty sure oh, I'm th I might be thinking of SB8 that doesn't have a rape and inc incest exception. Um, so if Roe and Casey fall, states certainly won't be required to have those exceptions. They can decide this is what we want to have. This is what we don't want to have. Um, there might be, I, I would expect in a number of states, there will be litigation under state constitutions about what those bans look like and whether um, you have to have some of those exceptions um, in those bans. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what that looks like. Um, but, you know, the, the floor that is created by Roe and Casey goes away. Um, so states can basically decide what they think that their individual um, uh, statutes uh, should look like. Um, and even in the context of exceptions for life and health, you know, part of the challenge there is providers feeling confident um, that, they're, that they are at that point of that exception kicking in. Right. Um, so some things will be obvious if, if a if a person has an ectopic pregnancy, it's never going to be successful. The only thing that it can do is basically, you know, kill this woman or ruin her chances um, of, of having children in the future. That's something that you have to be responsive to um, what you want to worry about. So I think there was a case many, many years ago, which actually led to the change in the Irish law on abortion, which was a woman who was losing her pregnancy. It was clear that she, that this was not a pregnancy that could survive. Um, and she was in a hospital in Ireland. She was in a Catholic hospital. Um, and they waited so long to get to the point of doing the abortion that she died because they needed to make sure that there was no heartbeat, right? That they needed to be totally clear. Um, and as a consequence, she died. So, you know, we already have providers in the United States saying, all right, well, you know, if I have a statute in my jurisdiction 
that has this, what looks like a very narrow medical emergency exception, what's the point at which I am emergent, where it's emergent enough that I can go ahead and do that abortion and not necessarily put myself at risk for prison um, or, for, or for losing my license to practice medicine. Thank you. That's really, um, that's helpful and responsive to the questions. There's another question too about um, state laws and the, what happens, for example, if someone were to, um, let me, um, it, can a resident be punished for leaving one state in order to obtain abortion in another state? Um, Ron or Katie, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I don't know if there are any of my first year constitutional law students listening in. <clears throat> They will, they will, their ears were pricked up because at the last minute, it was the last question in the final exam that I just, uh, great. Uh, you know, I don't think we, we, we have the, the last word on that. I certainly have some opinions uh, that for a, a person, a, a, a citizen of the United States to seek to travel to another state to do something that is perfectly legal in that state for that person's original state to try to interfere with that, I think would raise serious concerns, and I wouldn't mind being a lawyer making the argument under the privileges, maybe on the privileges and immunities clause of Article 4, the privileges or immunities clause of the 14th Amendment, maybe maybe even the dormant commerce clause. I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit less uh, uh, less enthusiastic about, about that one, but it would seem to me there are, there would be some very weighty constitutional arguments about any state trying to certainly criminalize uh, uh, the right of interstate travel to go to another state to do something that's perfectly legal there. Um, uh, and uh, so um, I, I have, I will predict there are going to be attempts to do so. We've already heard uh, about su such attempts and I think that will, that is going to be an issue that's gonna have to work its way, uh, way through the courts. Uh, uh, and I, I know many people are already preparing uh, for that argument. Obviously, if that is a solution, assuming that, uh, that those, channel, the, those attempts to do that are, are struck down, that is useful for women who are able, have the ability to travel to another state. Now, it's not easy to travel from Texas to New Jersey or, or whatever, whatever the nearest state may be. Maybe a little easier from Pennsylvania uh, to New Jersey, if that ends up being the case. But Unfortunately, because the geographic location, it, it's not as if it's a random mixture. There are, uh, there are geographic clumpings of states um, in which the, the right to an abortion is going to remain uh, unfettered and it's going to be uh, difficult for women to travel for, from uh, those states in the heartland like, like in Texas to travel uh, that distance. And that is going to be um, a, a, a that is going to be a much more difficult problem to solve, at least through through legal uh, legal challenges. Thank you, Katie. Um, so I just wanted to chime in. Um, we've been, despite saying I'm I'm not the sky is falling person, I did want to talk about one possibility that is hinted at in the decision, which we really haven't discussed yet, and that would call into question the idea of a patchwork of laws nationwide. Um, and that is, you know, one of the longstanding goals of the anti-abortion movement, um, uh, uh, you know, which they sort of uh, abandoned for a period of time, but I have no doubt will be revived if Dobbs come out, comes out as it does, is recognition of fetal personhood as an affirmative constitutional right. And I think there are a number of places in the leaked draft that at least speak in sort of sympathetic language towards that idea. And to be clear what the implications of that would be, if a fetus is a person, then they too cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, which then calls into the qu question the ability of any state to permit abortion. Um, so that is obviously would be a much more uh, radical step, but it's one that I think is not entirely um, uh, impossible to foresee, again, perhaps not two years from now, but uh, depending on, on how uh, litigation proceeds from this draft opinion. Um, so I, I wanna add a comment um, um, and then also ask a question to Ron and Katie. 
didn't see that coming, did you? Uh-huh. Um, so the comment is, it has long been a sort of tenant of the um, anti-choice movement, um, not to punish women for having abortions, but to punish people who provide abortions. Um, and I think one of the things that we are gonna see, um, particularly in the world that we live in now, where medication abortion is available, right? So you can order pills online, have them delivered to your house and safely self-manage um, an abortion. Um, so I think that that line, which used to be, oh, we don't punish women um, because you know women women are victims of the abortion industry and we need to protect them and we don't need to punish them. I think that line is going to end up being erased because it's going to be harder to identify where and when people are accessing abortion services. Um, and so you worry a little bit about what that looks like, right? Does it look like a you know a Texas bounty hunter law where somebody says, "Hey, my neighbor got this suspicious package in the mail," um, you know? So so I worry about that a little bit too. But I'm I am I am the sky is falling person, so I. I am preparing for that. But the question that I wanted to ask um, of Ron uh, and Katie is, so there are about um, 13 states that have trigger laws, right? They have laws on the books that say, as soon as Roe versus Wade falls, abortion is illegal um, in our jurisdiction. And I have been sort of operating on the assumption that, you know, like a self-executing sort of law like that is perfectly acceptable, perfectly constitutional, you know, that there there are no problems with that. Um, And then on Twitter, I've seen people sort of debating whether that's true or not. And I'm curious whether you all have thoughts on whether there would be anything problematic about having a law that simply says, well, when this gets when this gets overturned, then here's what the new rules are. You know, I, 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 I've heard of, yeah, I, we, we know about such laws and I get my, my initial reaction is, yeah, there's, I can't think of no constitutional argument that would prevent a state from doing that, any problems would be, I guess, in uh, of statutory interpretation. How do you interpret whether the statutory condition has been met or not? Um, if we got a sort of uh, an in-between opinion, which we may not be getting, but if we had gotten one, how how would you interpret it? Uh, but that would be, I guess, a question of statutory interpretation and not a constitutional one. I'd be interested because I, I I don't tweet. I must admit, what what what. Is there a constitutional argument that uh, such trigger laws are uh, um, ha- uh, have some constitutional defect? I mean, the only argument I can think of, and I have not been following this dialogue on Twitter, is that they are potentially retroactive insofar as they apply to, um, you know, pregnancies that were conceived prior to the date on which they were they become effective. Is that Kim? Kim is that the nature of the argument, or? I, ha- I mean, I, I unfortunately I couldn't sort of unpack it totally. I was just like, I don't understand why people are arguing this because it seems like it wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> but I was just fascinated by the idea that you could um, that it's that possibly there's a problem with the idea of sort of you know uh, predicting a future and then passing legislation to try to um, you know fix a problem that hasn't that doesn't even exist yet. There's something about that that feels sort of weird. Right, um, but but it seems like something that you can get away with personally. So, what do I know? All right, sorry. Thank you. So this is a good time for us to pause, and I will give you the CLE code. The CLE code is abortion. It is not case sensitive. So again, the CLE code is abortion, and I see that Joe had already put it in the chat. Thank you. Um, let's just uh, shift gears a little bit and. Um, and and talk about um, the what it means that there was this leaked opinion from an institutional perspective um, from the on the supreme court itself what are some of the implications for law clerks what are you hearing about um what law clerks should or should not be doing what justices should or should not be doing Um, are there any changes that are happening now on the court because an opinion has been leaked is this the first time that we've had a leaked opinion um, so maybe I'm going to call on Ron first. Well, um, I'll admit when I saw that uh, at first, I was in utter disbelief uh, th- that this could happen. Uh, I was a law clerk. Uh, interesting story. I was a law clerk to uh, the late Judge Leonard Garth. Um, for that reason, I know Justice Alito. He also clerked for Judge Garth a few years before I did. Uh, and for that reason, let me say this now, although I disagree with Justice Alito on a whole host of things, uh, 
be because we share that bond, I will always have the highest personal regard for him um, personally. And, um, and, uh, and I, I think it's because that we, we shared that, uh, we shared that bond with the judge and the relationship between a law clerk uh, and, a, um, and the judge is, if it goes right, is one of the most um, remarkable professional experience. It certainly was one of the most remarkable professional experiences I had. It is inconceivable to me, I guess it's possible now, uh, for that trust to be broken like this. And um, I am really fearful for how it could affect the workings of, uh, of the court. Uh, I hear now Nina Totenberg is reporting that some Supreme Court uh, clerks are retaining counsel. They are, uh, they're obviously becoming very, very nervous. They're being asked to hand over their cell phones, <laughs> despite the Supreme Court's recent opinion that cell phones, uh, warrantless searches of cell phones are uh, are forbidden under, under the Fourth Amendment. Um, I, I can't imagine what that is doing to the relationship between a law clerk uh, and a judge. I hope uh, that is not the case, but it is, um, it obviously, it has, I mean, we, we've seen that it. it has uh, it, uh, seriously uh, hurt the ability to have that type of uh, confidential relationship, which I think is absolutely necessary um, and, a, and a, a good part of how the judicial system should work, that judges, uh, reach their uh, reach their decisions through a deliberate process with their fellow judges on a multi-judge court and with the with a small group of um, convention confidential advisors who, whom they can trust um, without that i i've heard actually suggestions and there's nothing particularly wrong with it judges should uh, publish their opinions the way that agencies publish proposed rules there should be a notice and comment period well, I don't buy that. I don't buy that. I think that's uh, that's a very different, uh, a very different situation uh, by administrative agencies who are engaging in a type of quasi-legislative responsibility, which uh, ultimately should be done by elected public officials. And there's a very different reason why public transparency and disclosure is necessary. I mean, call me old-fashioned. I think that while that opinion is being percolated, so to speak, there has to be that level of trust and confidence. Um, because what I assume, and we've seen this happen, that this was a draft opinion. What what that draft opinion would have looked like without the leak, we'll now never really know. Uh, uh, whether it whether positions were hardened necessarily because of the leak, uh, uh, we'll never know. It would be very regrettable if it was. And I know the courts, the justices say no, it won't affect the the, the way the court decides things. But how, how can it not? Justices are human, just the way uh, th that we all are. So uh, I am unabashedly aghast at, at this leak, um, and um, I, I hope we find a way to to put that genie back in the bottle. Well, and then Justice Sotomayor was worried about what the the leaked opinion says about um, the exposing the politics, the raw politics, and interactions. Uh, Katie and Kim, do you have any comments about? But this leak opinion does to the, the the legitimacy of the court. So first, I'll just say, as somebody who uh, whose work often dabbles in legal history, the politics have long been out there. If you want to go search for them, many of these records open, you know, some 15, 20 years later. So you can actually see the back and forth. So to some extent, the 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 sort of details are there for uh, uh, the finding. I mean, I do agree with Ron. Absolutely. That 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 the release of this in real time is a institutional crisis for the court in a different way. Um, I want to point out, we don't yet know if the leak was a law clerk. It, it, like, it could have not been a law clerk. Um, and I, I actually think that's one of probably the most corrosive things for the court is going to be grappling with not knowing who to trust and therefore perhaps mistrusting everyone, both one's colleagues, one cl one's clerks, perhaps the staff. Uh, um, the significant others of their clerks or their significant others of the justices, right? Uh, without identifying who the leaker was, then you have this sort of pervasive sense of 
uh, doubt and skepticism about everyone. Yeah, I mean, I think that there, you know, we have been having so much converse, so much public conversation about the Supreme Court over the last several months and really over the last few years. I mean, we've had these, um, you know, deeply contentious and problematic confirmation hearings. Um, we've had, I mean, the, the last confirmation hearing for Justice Jackson was just like, O over the top foolishness in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, and part of what Justice Sotomayor was raising when she raised that sort of question about whether the court could, you know, survive this stench um, was this sense of, you know, we, we just decided two abortion cases just a few years ago. And yet once we get new justices on the court, we take another abortion case because now we've got the votes to overrule Roe. Um, so I think that there is this sort of legitimacy question and how do we think about the court? And of course, it's always been the case that these are people, right? And so, but there's, I think there's also been this, this um, very public sort of, we're all friends here, right? I mean, we all remember the sort of RBG, Scalia, you know, we're on the opposite side of all these cases, but then we talk about opera together. Um, but I think that, that that is just falling apart as we watch people sort of criticize each other in public. And um, so we're in a really interesting spot and I don't know what that's gonna mean in terms of actual action. Um, you know, we've got the people on one side who are, you know, doing all the court packing stuff and we should do this, that and the other thing. Um, but I'm not sure we actually have political will for any of that. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens. But, I, you know, from my, from my perspective um, as a law professor and sort of watching some of our students really grapple with this sense of it's all it's all madness. There's no there's nothing behind it. It's all it's all smoke and mirrors. And um, I'd like to think that that's not the case. Right. Um, and so I would like for us to get back to a place where people really feel like, you know, each branch is doing what it is supposed to do and is doing so in a way that we can all be uh, that is ethical um, and that we can all feel proud of, even if we don't always dis if even if we don't always agree with the decisions that are being made. Can I invite uh, the speakers to talk a little bit about the political implications of this? I know we're, we're here to talk about law and the opinion and, and rights, but um, I think one of the, the big elephant in the room is that there is um, a, there are political ramifications of this for the upcoming midterm elections. And I'm just curious to hear whether, uh, this is a, one of the questions that was raised, whether, um, you know, where politics fit in here. I mean, we. Um, I, I have some thoughts that I that we I, I'd share, but I, I'd prefer that you uh, you share with us what your thought, where polit where the uh, the political implications or where politics, how politics influence this opinion in the first place. Um, well, can I? I'll, I'll just okay. say one thing. Yeah. Like, if if nothing else comes from this, people. Um, coming to have a very deep respect for courts and for the importance of elections in terms of who ends up on our courts um, is a really valuable lesson for folks, right? I feel like oftentimes, um, you know, people obviously care about who's in Congress for them. People obviously care about um, who the president is gonna be. Um, and they don't really think about the impact that courts have on their lives and not just the Supreme Court, Right. I mean, the, the number of judges in this country who are elected and people are like, well, those are elections that don't really matter. They matter a huge, huge amount. So, you know, if 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 something that comes out of this is people feeling like, well, I guess maybe I should pay attention to the, all this judgy stuff. Um, I think that's actually a valuable, a valuable thing. Um, I also think there's a possibility, you know, when you have these, these, these moments of crisis, um, you know, sometimes it really does help people sort of crystallize their, um, you know, their beliefs, their wants, and their expectations for the country that they live in. And so it's possible that this will really inspire some folks mm -hmm. um, to be more active, to be more civically engaged, to pay more attention, um, to run for office. Um, and that that's possibly a good thing too. So, you know, this is me desperately trying to be optimistic. Um, but I do think that, you know, there are some, there are some good possibilities that come out of what is otherwise, I think, a really difficult time for our country. But I, I think it's probably true that most average voters did not have uh, issues that were coming with the Supreme Court high on their list of 
regions to cast a vote one way or another, at least in the past a few decades. Maybe that's changing somewhat now. Um, but you know, it, it's still a little bit uh, uh, challenging to uh, focus voters' attentions, even on the issues that the court is going to um, go going to decide in the next few years. We're about to get, and some of us are holding our breath on this one, a big decision on uh, the gun control case, the New York City uh, 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 handgun case. There are uh, there are a lot of predictions, and court watchers are saying, well, the court may be doing some things on. Uh, maybe weakening anti-discrimination laws uh, in, in interpreting the religious uh, freedom uh, uh, constitutional right um, in a way that it hadn't done before. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, th those who, may, who, who are speculating, for instance, and this maybe is getting a little bit into the weeds, but it can have an effect on the average voter if if it um, if it is presented in the correct way, that some of the justices may be taking aim at the administrative state uh, and uh, 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 cutting back on the ways in which administrative agencies can be delegated quasi legislative power through through rulemaking. That sound uh, it's very difficult to put that into a soundbite, but that could have some very dramatic effects. It already has had some effects on things, uh, on the way the courts have a lot, for instance, on what President Biden has been, been able to do with regard to the pandemic. He has been, he has been restricted uh, through, through use of his power over uh, administrative agencies. So although the idea, the concept sounds about uh, legally abstract, it has some very difficult uh, very some very profound uh, practical effects. Um, I, I, do I hope, as a law professor, that the public becomes more aware of the issues uh, that are coming before the courts and realizes that uh, that they can affect their lives? Uh, sure, probably there aren't going to be as many issues as the current one involving Dobbs and Roe that are going to capture uh, uh, the public's attention quite so forcefully. But there are a lot of the, those issues coming down the road. I just wanted to add, um, you know, state politics to the conversation because obviously, who sits in state legislatures and in state governorships um, matters quite a lot when there are no longer constitutional restrictions on what states can do in the context of abortion. Um, and I think it's also important, uh, you know, Ron sort of alluded to this earlier to recognize that even in those areas that remain currently protected by the Constitution, that the court has not repudiated precedents like Obergefell or, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 any of those other precedents protecting fundamental rights, this opinion surely will embolden state legislatures to push that boundary, um, right, and to try to begin to enact laws that may be unconstitutional under current law, but they might argue under Dobbs uh, 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 should be permitted. And even if those laws are struck down, it's important to recognize the real harm that that does to people in the meantime, right? Uh, even laws that are ultimately declared unconstitutional can do quite a lot of harm to the people who are subjected to them. And this is where, again, state legislatures, state governorships really matter um, because those are the places we're gonna see that type of legislation coming up. And, and Katie just reminded me of something that's also, you know, just been been blowing my mind um, for months and months now, which is, um, you know, at SB8, which was, you know, wildly <laughs> unconstitutional um, from Texas, six week ban that says the, gov the government, the state government has no role whatsoever in enforcing this statute, right? And so sort of trying to strip it from ever being reviewed um, by a court, which is just bonkers, absolutely bonkers. And the court has just let that ride for months and months and months. It's really hard for me to wrap my mind around that because I don't care what the topic was, you cannot let a state simply decide, here's this easy way that we can avoid ever having judicial review of our legislation. That's a problem. Um, and so I, that that is another very strange thing that has come out of this session um, of the court. And I'm super curious to see how that plays itself out. I just, I just don't see how they can let that stand um, because that undermines their 
authority that undermines the authority of the court. So um, that's that's a thing that really needs to be fixed too, because that's just as I said, you know, bonkers. Um, and so I hope something that makes sense comes out of that too. Thank you. So um, I was going to comment earlier that Katie didn't sound quite optimistic um, earlier when she was talking about those state laws. So I, I'd like for us to begin talking about alternatives um, to what in the to uh, in combating the impact of Dobbs. Um, I'll start with Katie um, with the work that you did um, with uh, in, in your prior work and I guess I, I, still in your current work right now. Tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are regarding what are some things that um, lawyers and students and others can do? I have to say the um, benefit of having been a social movement lawyer and then being a social movement scholar is that you, with the negative comes the positive in the sense that you can look at the scope of history and recognize that, that we wind up here uh, you know, periodically, right? That um, moments where social movements are down in the courts does not necessarily mean they're out. Um, and for me, the, the sort of classic example of this is the LGBT rights movement in 1986, getting the opinion in Bowers versus Hardwick, which says, uh, you know, there is no fundamental right to uh, gay sodomy, right? That this is not a thing. Um, and that just is super derisive of the idea that gay people might have families or intimacy or rights, right? Um, and, and that looked really bad. And you get a series of terrible decisions in the lower courts that are basically like, this means that even under the Equal Protection Clause, there's nothing governments can't do to gay people because what's worse than making them criminals? Um, and yet, uh, 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 you know, what we see is the LGBT rights movement starts to build support for uh, a fundamental right to, to individual intimacy in the state courts under state constitutions. Um, there's a lot of work done by individuals. You know, uh, uh, it sounds cheesy, but, you know, research has really shown knowing gay people. <laughs> fundamentally affects people's views on these issues, um, makes them view them differently. So the, the, the you know, courage of individual people to come out to the people that they love and that they know. Um, and then, you know, less than 20 years later, we see that uh, opinion reversed. Um, and of course, it's a similar, similar story in the context of same-sex marriage. Um, that uh, that's really a long, long game, uh, incremental using the state courts and state constitutions while building public understanding and um, public support. Um, and I, I think that's that's sort of what's what's got to be on people's minds now. <clears throat> well, um, you know, if, if, I, I don't think I'm revealing any secrets of, within uh, organizations like the ACLU, nationwide advocacy organizations, that probably the past 30 years have been used to trying to seek a judicial remedy in the federal courts. Obviously, right now, there is not a lot of reason to predict they're going to be as successful given the current composition of the courts. But, uh, you know, federalism, which used to be thought to be a somewhat conservative uh, concept, is, is, I think, at best neutral. And maybe uh, uh, those of us, since we, we teach at the uh, State Law School of New Jersey, which has such a history of using its state constitution independently and more, even before this, more proactively than the federal constitution. We speak from a, a, a convenient, comfortable uh, position, but I think a lot of nationwide organizations like ACLU uh, and others are realizing that uh, th there's more than one way to get a judicial remedy. And state, uh, state remedies, state constitutions, the independent, the history and tradition of each particular state may be, may be a tool that they can usefully use, even if they don't get the same results uh, nationwide. So for me, uh, the, in that view, federalism is neither liberal nor conservative, progressive or, or whatever. It is simply, it, it is a fact. And if right now it means that uh, our, those of us who want to use our tools, uh, our skills, uh, should direct them to state courts. Well, th that's what it means. Uh, I know in the Constitutional Rights Clinic, uh, uh, my late, our late colleague Frank Askin decided 20 years ago he's going to bring these cases in the New Jersey state courts because you get anything that the federal constitution has anyway, plus you always have the argument 
uh, that the state constitution or state traditions, history and traditions, which is history and traditions of the state in New Jersey, by the way, is a, an express uh, criterion that the state Supreme Court uses to determine whether to interpret our state constitution more broadly. And guess what? In New Jersey, we have a lot of history and traditions that they might not have in other states that have resulted um, in more expansive definition of rights. Uh, so um, I'm not saying that I'm looking forward to it, but I think we just have to redirect uh, our efforts and it makes it an exciting time in some ways to be a civil rights, uh, individual rights or a public interest lawyer. It's, you, you gotta, you've got to uh, diversify your repertoire. Um, you know, I'll say one of the things that 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 bums me out is that um, our colleague Bob Williams retired a couple of years ago, <laughs> and boy, would it be nice to have him around um, uh, these days as you know, as somebody who is, um, I was going to say, a preeminent, the preeminent um, scholar on state constitutions, certainly, certainly in this country. So, you know, I, I like Ron. I think that as as law schools and certainly as state law schools that, you know, we, we have obligations here to sort of think about what is it that we can do? What are the ways that we can help our students um, and train our students, right? I mean, a lot of students go through law school and will never see a state constitution or read a state constitution or even understand um, the importance of state constitutions. So as we think about what we do in our clinical space, um, what it means to bring back this you know, probably won't be the women's rights clinic, probably will be like a gender justice clinic because um, it's 2022 now, um, you know, but really thinking about, you know, how do we expand the kinds of opportunities that our students get to learn and to become really skilled advocates and to recognize all the tools in the toolbox. Um, you know, everything from what you do on a state level to the conversations you have with state legislators to crafting, you know, model legislation. Um, and I think that that is something that, that that's actually incredibly valuable um, and something that we can give not just to our students, but to our community and to our state. Thank you. Let me give the second code for tonight, um, CLE, and that is, oops. Apologies, it's um, it's all the way up now. Oh, there it is. Right, not not case sensitive. So right. Thank you, Joe, for putting it in the chat. And so the CLE credit uh, code is right. Okay, so um, we have about uh, fifteen minutes left before we have to close, and I'd like to give an opportunity to our audience members to um, to raise some questions. Um, and and I'll I'll start with one that was um, sent over earlier. What, is there hope for new fundamental rights? And then we, we talked about about the methodology that the the Justice Alito employed, and courts uh, how it has been used in the past, of course, as part of the test. Is there hope still for the recognition of fundamental rights? Can I start please. on this one? Yes, please. So I am feeling in an optimistic mood about this one because I have just been reading the last five years of transgender constitutional law cases. And there are not many cases in which uh, litigants have presented the argument that there is a fundamental right to gender autonomy. But in every case they have raised it, except for one, they have won in the lower courts. Um, and if you think about you know, the sort of line of cases, what, what is fundamental personal decision-making, uh, um, you know, the idea that how we identify ourselves in terms of our gender, how we express our gender, that that is really fundamental to who we are and, and uh, as human beings, that the state shouldn't get to determine that, that they shouldn't get to penalize us for that, um, right? That's a pretty uh, profound argument. That being said, if I were a litigator looking at raising this argument right now, I would not continue to raise it in federal court. I would take it to state court and try to build support in the in a few state courts for this argument. I think um, raising any new fundamental rights in the federal courts right now probably is not the the best strategy. Although you know, in in a midterm future, perhaps it comes back to the the federal courts. Ron or Kim? Yeah, well, I, I absolutely agree. I say I, that is, I think, the methodology that a lot of individual rights, civil rights, civil liberties lawyers are, are using. Those who I who, who I uh, commune with, in fact, 
I will say, I, I will say about what I'm writing a brief right now after I get off putting the finishing touches, trying to use history and tradition to say that a certain right has a special attraction, at least in, in New Jersey. Um, and, you know, it's, as I've been, as said before, I think uh, lawyers in this area are students. We've got to teach our students just to recognize these, uh, the, these methodologies um, and to find the proper way to, to invoke them. Uh, yes, I think the use of the history and traditions, I mean, it, it was always there. Uh, it is not as if it suddenly sprung fully grown from Azusa's head as, as this new methodology. Um, so uh, uh, it is up to us to try to, us as law teachers, to teach our students how to recognize and how to use it to achieve the results that, uh, for, for which they're choosing to advocate. I also think there's a lot of space here to think not just about legal strategy, but political strategy. And, and what I mean by that is, um, just to give a really specific example, many, many years ago, there was a very strong push for personhood amendments um, on, this, on the state level. Um, um, and those are amendments that, you know, going back to something that Katie said early, right, creating fetal personhood, which then, of course, bans abortion, and then a whole host of other things um, that flow from that. And one of the reasons why those ballot measures and those attempts to legislate failed was because abortion and fertility industry folks came together. Um, and normally those people do not work together. The fertility industry folks do not want to be <laughs> lumped in um, with the abortion folks, but they recognize this is a place where there is a, there's an existential crisis for both of us um, if these things happen. And so, you know, I also think it's really important to figure out, you know, where, where are the places where sometimes you're bedfellows may be strange bedfellows, um, but they get you to where you need to go to, or even sort of thinking about, you know, those early gender rights cases where the plaintiffs were men, right? You tell people that and they're like, well, that seems strange. Well, no, that's a winning strategy. That's how you get, you know, where, where you're trying to go. So, you know, I think that there are some real opportunities for creativity here in very interesting ways. Um, I think there are some real opportunities for, you know, in, in Derek Bell's words, for there to be some serious interest convergence happening here um, that get us to a place that 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 ultimately is is a good place. Um, might, might be a little uh, tussling that goes on before we get there, but I think there's a lot of potential in this moment. So we need to be creative. We will be busy. Um, we have to engage in um, uh, engage in state litigation. I'm reminded of the, I, I work on immigrants' rights, as you know, and a few years ago after the Muslim ban was passed, um, and then it led to several different immigration law, um, ch changes in immigration law, those of us who do immigrants' rights work had to do exactly what you were, what, you have, what you're all suggesting. And in some ways they worked, in some ways they didn't. So I think that's just, but we have to try, right? We have to engage in creative uh, lawyering, political lawyering. So um, here's another question, and if you can read the tea leaves. Um, a question arose about whether the final, what do you really think the final Dobbs opinion will look like? Do you think or, or hope that maybe this was just a draft and then what will come out maybe as early as Wednesday, right? Well, I know some of us today were refreshing the, uh, the website to see whether it will come out. So what do you think the final opinion might look like? Or what do you hope anyway, if you don't know what it would look like, if you don't want to predict, what are you hopeful for? Well, I, I mean, to, to be realistic, I, mean, I think those of us who have been watching this, when the draft opinion came out, perhaps law professors or other court watchers were perhaps less shocked, at least about the result, than the general public, because I think we, we've been seeing this, the, the the indications of this. Certainly the oral argument gave a strong indication of where a major majority of the court was going to go. There was, of course, some speculation that perhaps Chief Justice Roberts could moderate the opinion that although it would overrule Roe and Casey somewhat, it would leave intact some, uh, some, 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 some basic, uh, it, we wouldn't be back to totally to, to total eradication of the right. Whether uh, he could have done so without the leak, whether it has made it more difficult for him uh, to do so in light of the leak, that's that that's uh, utter speculation. 
uh, I think, realistic that that's probably the most we could hope for out of this court, that a somewhat less uh, draconian opinion that that basically uh, tears Roe versus Wade down to, to the foundation level, uh, but that leaves some basic, something in which you can make some basic argument of some right, uh, even though limited right to choose, might 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 happen. I'm not particularly optimistic, quite frankly, because I think the votes are there, and I think we saw this before the league. The votes are there just to just to completely overturn Roe. And Kim, um, if if you had asked me um, about what I thought the Supreme Court was going to do with this case before they were asked to halt SB8, I would have said, oh, you know, they're going to continue to chip away at Roe, um, but they're not going to overrule it. But once they let SB8 sit, I was like, oh, they're, 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 they're feeling themselves, <laughs> right? They recognize um, the power of what they're able to do here. And so I, I assumed that we were going to get an opinion that overruled Roe. Um, and so knowing that that is what's going to happen, I'm sort of torn a little bit because on one hand, the opinion that was leaked just wasn't a very good opinion. So I'm kind of ex hoping, right, or expecting on some level that they'll that they'll do a better job of shoring up the arguments that they made, um, particularly some of the history arguments, right? Um, some of the arguments about, um, you know, reliance. I mean, there, there are whole briefs in every single um, abortion case that has gone up to the Supreme Court in the last several years. There's always a brief that's basically all women, women lawyers talking about why abortion has been critical to their ability to be able to move forward in their careers, right? Um, so I feel like they're going to fill in a lot of those holes and try to patch some of that stuff. Um, but then that's not necessarily a good thing, right? Because you're just actually making it a stronger um, opinion. What I do think we're going to get um, are, you know, it, at least one or two absolutely stellar dissents. So, you know, there's that. Um, and the hope of course always is that a dissent at some point in the future ends up being a majority opinion. So this is the part where you really get to call me a Pollyanna. There is like this teeny tiny part of me that's like maybe the opinion was leaked because somebody was waffling on their vote. Um, right. You know, we I mean, that's what happened in Casey. You know, Kennedy switched his vote and we got this um, plurality opinion affirming Roe, but allowing chipping away at, at lots of other things. And, you know, I, I think that that is that's an unlikely account here, but it's not an impossible account. Um, you know, I, I think if you had asked me before the opinion and before they declined to strike down uh, SB8, I would have shared a similar perspective to Dean Muttress and why, why would they bother to overrule this when they are gonna be able to just chip away and eviscerate it through, you know, sequential opinions. Um, uh, so that's that'll be my, I don't think that's likely, but I'm gonna add that as just a little like, a little sparkle of question mark. Uh, could this have been uh, because somebody's vote was wavering? And if so, I think, you know, all bets are off in terms of where we might land. You know, it was, there was something about reading the opinion um, in preparation for this that just really stood out to me, and that was the historical discussion. And there was the, the appendix had a list of all of these um, states that supposedly um, banned um, that that addressed um, abortion or the banned abortion, right? And so um, historians have since come out to say that Justice Alito got it wrong. It's not the case that at the sign, if we were to go back to the 14th Amendment, for example, I mean, he says in the opinion that there were uh, three fourths of the states that had banned abortion when some historians have said, actually, no, that's not true. Maybe there were 16, but even those 16 need to be questioned. And so for me, my hope is that the historical discussion will, will be corrected because so many have come out. Um, but um, I'm not really, um, I'm, I'm not as optimistic as I would like to be because the votes are there, unfortunately. And so then that brings us to some of the, the, re, the, the, the work that the lawyers and law schools, law professors, law students need to do to engage in. And as we mentioned earlier, um, here at Rutgers, we are going to, uh, to, to have a, the Women's Rights and Gender Justice Law Clinic named after Justice Ginsburg 
to, to try to, to, uh, to engage in this kind of work. Um, there is, uh, so we have about five minutes left. And so I would like to give each of the panelists a chance just to give what I would say, maybe just closing remarks about, you know, what, what are their uh, final thoughts that they would like to share with the group. And um, I'll start off with, with Ron, and then we'll go to Katie, and then um, Kim. Well, you know, this is, uh, this is not an easy time to be a, a, a constitutional rights uh, a lawyer. Uh, but I still feel um, um, maybe uh, Katie is sort of rubbing off on me a little bit. It's somewhat optimistic. It, it's the time for us, frankly, to up our game. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, I still, and maybe call me Pollyanna, I still have fundamental uh, belief in the judicial system with all its faults uh, to the deliberative process. They make mistakes. They make decisions that a lot of us disagree with. They make decisions that a lot of us hope do not eventually uh, stand the test of time. But I mean, if we don't have confidence in the general process, then I begin to wonder: um, Are we in the wrong? Are we in the wrong profession? And and I've still got it. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be keeping. We are going to have to change our methodologies somewhat. That makes it you no. Know, um, be that makes creativity in in, in our profession um, uh, a very desirable uh, commodity. The one thing I will say, I mean, this is how, the one thing I would do in the federal courts and to uh, to to the new conservative majority that we we should and can do is basically hold them to account for consistency. They have uh, they have adopted a new way of doing things. All right, but then it's got to be the same way, the use of the same methodology uh, with some consistency. Uh, for instance, the uh, suggestion that Congress pass a, uh, a fetal personhood bill. Well, it was a conservative court that said not too long ago that Congress doesn't have the power to create new substantive constitutional rights under section five of the 14th amendment, it merely enforces them. Well, I'm sorry, sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. If Congress can't do that uh, in trying to extend uh, the rights of religious freedom, it can't do that by essentially creating a new definition of, of personhood. Um, and uh, I think we can and should uh, point out to the court if arguments are being made that would be inconsistent with their own, because that's really judges have that, that's their last, claim to legitimacy that the fact that they whatever judicial philosophy they're using they're at least applying it consistently now i know there's a lot of reason for uh skepticism uh, that that is really what is going on and that politics are are have affected the courts i'm just saying that i think we have to at least in our methodology try to hold the, the courts and, and the judges to a, a jurisprudence that um that doesn't surrender the judicial process to complete politics. Um, so I'll just say really quickly, I, I completely agree with everything that Ron had to say. I, I think ideological nihilism is not a legal strategy. Um, and we are where we are today because people who did not have reason to hope, hoped and they put forward legal arguments and they argued them well and they, persuaded people. Um, and I do not believe that uh, even our current court, that there is a majority that is just conservative ideology all the way down. I think there are there are people of good faith on that court who are, um, are, are perhaps not on every issue, but uh, in the main willing to listen to legal arguments. Um, I will also echo Ron in saying that I think it is really important for progressives to get over their caginess about relying on certain types of arguments. Um, textualism can be a pro progressive legal methodology, even originalism. I've seen some of the critiques of this opinion as a non-originalist opinion, insofar as it does not ask what due process of law meant in at the time of the 14th Amendment and what sorts of rights it protected. Um, so I think, you know, using every tool in the toolbox and keeping the faith that, that um, better is possible in the future. 
Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just say, you know, at, at the moments when I'm feeling sort of most, most low about things, um, I'm, I'm just reminded what this country is capable of, right? And sometimes it's capable of things that are very uh, sad and damaging and awful. Um, and sometimes it is capable of absolute wonder. And I'm sort of sitting here and watching, you know, looking at those of us who are on this panel right now, um, most of whom would not have been law professors <laughs> not so long ago, right? So this, this is a country that is capable of really, really extraordinary things. Um, and I, you know, I believe in our system. Um, that's, I became a lawyer because I believe in our system and I continue to believe in our system. Um, and I feel incredibly lucky that every day we get to work with law students who are the, who are the future of this, of this country. They are the leaders, they are the judges, they are the you know, members of Congress. Um, so I feel like we're gonna end up in really good hands. With that, with those impactful words, I want to thank Dean Mutcherson, Professor Chen and Professor Iyer for um, engaging with us tonight, sharing your thoughts and perspectives. Thank you also to Joe Nagel and to Nate Nakao. And to all of you, thank you for joining us this evening. And we look forward to talking with you again in the very near future. Thanks and good night. Be safe, everyone.